All right. Um, actually, should I start? I didn't see the uh, notification, but. Yeah, I started, but you can start all over again. Yep. OK. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to today's session. My name is Andy Main. I'm a solutions engineer at uh, Data IQ, actually based right here in Toronto. And today I'm going to take you through an overview and demo of Data IQ DSS. So Data IQ DSS is really an end-to-end -end platform um, designed to accelerate your data science projects and basically get you from designing and building machine learning models and into production a whole lot faster. So I'm going to take you through a number of different activities that generally make up an analytical project. So things like accessing data from all your different data sources in your organization, um, to prepping and enriching and wrangling all that data for the purpose of then maybe creating models, and then the whole creation of the models and training of models, evaluating models, um, all done in the DSS platform. And then from there, we want to take those, those models and productionalize them. And this is typically a very difficult task in a lot of, uh, a lot of different organizations. So what we want to do is be able to visualize what we've created in terms of the output, understand and, and um, know how we've created the models, and then basically get them into a way that we can actually benefit and uh, get the value from them as well. So as I go through the platform, I just want you to keep in mind a couple key themes here. One is collaboration. So collaboration just allows different types of personas or people in your organization. You may have coders, non-coders, data engineers, business analysts, data scientists, all contributing their expertise to creating machine learning models. And Data IQ DSS allows those different personas to con collaborate and uh, contribute to the projects. Second is efficiency and reuse. Um, Data IQ DSS is really built around your changing environment. So you may have database platforms, data platforms, compute platforms, all that are changing constantly. We want to create the business logic that can run on whatever your environment is, and then also to share whatever is created and reuse whatever is created amongst people in the organization. Finally, visibility and governance. This is a pretty important topic these days around AI. So being able to create visual representations of your pipelines and have all the documentation for those built right in. Um, so that if somebody's coming to join a particular project, they can get up to speed very quickly and easily. And then you can apply as well any security and governance around that, um, or if there are regulatory uh, requirements around that, uh, we can include that as well. So let me go into the software. So this is the sign-on for Data IQ DSS. As you can see, this is a server-based platform. So users can come in just logging in through a URL and basically get to the content that they've been allowed or access to. So here I can go through all of the different content that uh, might be shared with my different teammates. I can see the projects, applications, folders. I can even get some uh, assistance or help very quickly and easily in the form of tutorials, videos, other demos, and use cases. So a lot of ways that I can really get started and um, help contributing on these projects. So let's go into a project first and take a look at what it looks like. So here we're going to look at, this is the example for today's session, it's a predictive maintenance where we're looking at the assets or components of a manufacturing process and what we're going to do is predict whether those components will fail or not. Um, so here I've got the main page of this project. I can see all of the contributors of who's contributing to this particular project. I can see some descriptive information about what the project is about, so telling different people what uh, what we're actually doing in this particular project. I have a task list that I can assign, say I'm a project manager, I can assign specific tasks to different people or users, um, and then basically check them off as we go through. And then over at the right, I have a timeline, so I can see all of the different contributions um, of those contributors to the project. And then in the middle, you can see this is all the different components of a project. I've got the flow, the modeling in the form of what's called the lab, dashboards, wiki. I'll just go into a wiki quickly just to show you some additional information that we can capture. And so the wiki is really just giving us more 
descriptive information about the project. I've got an overview. I can see information about how the modeling is performed. There's some data sources. I can see the scoring, the evaluation, and so on. So it really gives me a good view into what's actually happening in this particular project. Let's go into the flow. So here I have the flow of the project, and the flow really is what's actually happening in terms of the data, all the transformations, and then finally the modeling. All of the blue squares represent our different data sources. And so you can see I've got different types here represented by the different icons. I've got a flat file um, coming just basically from uh, a CSV maybe that I've uploaded to DSS. I've got a data source here that is from uh, Snowflake, so I'm accessing a Snowflake data source. Down here, I've got a Postgres SQL database that I'm pulling data from. And so all this data is going to come together as part of my predictive model. And uh, when, I'm gonna, I'm, when I bring in the data, then I'm going to perform a number of different steps on it as well. So we talked about accessing the data. Then the next step was really about um, transforming the data or wrangling the data. So I'm just going to highlight a data source. So over on the right here, we can see all of these different types of transformations that we can perform. So we have what are called recipes in the form of visual recipes. So those are for your non-coders who can point and click and basically just apply transformations very quickly and easily against the data. I've also got code recipes. So for coders who want to code in Python or R or SQL or whatever language they're comfortable in, we can apply those transformations against the data as well so that those different personas are contributing to our projects. And then finally down at the bottom, I have what are called plugins. And plugins are a way to extend the capabilities of Data IQ DSS through additional functionality. So any user can build plugins and make them available to the users of a project. Um, and basically just becomes another way to transform or operate on the data within a project. So going back to our flow here, we've got our different inputs of data. Let's take a look at one of those um, visual recipes. So this is a prepare recipe. And a prepare recipe is just basically transforming the data in a number of different ways. So here we're just creating some calculated fields. We're removing columns, renaming columns. I just go into add a new step, we can see all of the different types of things that we can perform on our data. So we've got over 90 different processors that we can use to apply against the data, including financial, string, mathematical, um, even code. So if I want to apply a Python function right within the visual recipe, uh, I could do that right here. Um, so it's just as simple as point and click to create these transformations on the data. Go back to our flow, let's just take a look at a couple of these code recipes. I mentioned the Python recipe. So here, a coder can come in and right in this interface, edit some Python code and apply some, uh, some logic against the data to basically perform some type of transformation or uh, operation on the data. So there, they can just put the code right in there. They can also go into a Jupyter Notebook interface to enter their code and work with it over there. Um, or basically bring in maybe a code sample from uh, other code samples that people have shared within the DSS environment. Nice thing about the code environments is I can also specify the environment in which they run. So in Python, I may want to use specific libraries or packages so I can change the Python environment very simply and easily. I can also change the container. So again, this is where we make D uh, DSS is flexible uh, based on your compute platforms. Here I'm specifying the container of where this is going to execute. We could leverage maybe a Kubernetes container or a cluster and basically have the Python executed over there. Just go back, we'll take a look at our SQL recipe. So again, similar to the Python, if I have SQL coders who understand data or maybe have specific functions, specific uh, SQL that they want to apply against the data, we can just drop it right in here and uh, run that right within uh, the visual recipe here and have that applied against the data just as we would with any of the other visual recipes. I'm just going to go in. In this case, what we've done is brought our data in from all those different data sources. So we've got some asset information. We've got sort of sensor readings for the assets. We've got some history and 
consumption information for uh, all of those different data sources. And then what we've done is uh, used uh, a visual recipe called a join recipe to basically join the different data sources together. So here we've got three different inputs, three different data sources, and we're joining them based on a particular field. And so we can specify in the join how we're actually matching or joining the data. We can do it on specific fields. We can specify multiple fields, a number of different ways. We can also specify the join type, um, depending on how the uh, data sources are uh, related to each other. Our join recipe allows us to basically um, bring the data together. I can specify columns. So if I only want certain columns from our in, uh, inputs, we can carry them through. And then just basically in terms of the execution here, I can even specify where this is going to execute this particular step. So right now it's just running in DSS, but if I wanted that to run in Spark, I could actually just change that and have it run in a different environment. And again, depending on the actual operation, where, it, where it's located, where the data is located, I might be able to choose another compute environment to run that as well. And this is particularly useful when your data, for instance, is in the database. We want to leverage the database to do actually all of the processing so we can push it back to the database. So just to go back to the flow one more time. Um, so in this case, we, we brought all of our asset information together. Uh, the next step is we wanted to perform the modeling. So we've got the data in a form that's ready to perform some modeling. We've done all our data access. We've done the data wrangling. Uh, at this point, we're ready to do some modeling. So at this point, I've got my data set. I'm going to go over here into what's called the lab. And the lab is a way for me to iterate through some building of, of machine learning models. So if I click on there, I can do this in a couple ways. I can use the visual analysis. So here you can see a few different ways in which we can create some visual analysis. Again, as a coder, if I'm a coder, I can come in and create a code uh, modeling notebook against the data as well. So again, depending on the persona, we can do it in, in different ways. I'm just going to click New Analysis to create a new modeling uh, set of modeling. And so here, I'm going to go over to, into the models. We haven't created one yet. So if I were to start and do some visual modeling, I could say Create the Model. Now it's going to just ask me a few questions. So in terms of the data, uh, do I want to do supervised or unsupervised learning? In this case, I've got uh, a particular field called failure, and uh, we're just predicting whether a particular component is going to fail or not. So I'm going to do a prediction. The field uh, that we're predicting is called failure. It's just a binary field. And then from there, DSS asks us, do we want to do auto modeling or do we want to have an expert step through. So I can use expert to do deep learning. I can choose specific algorithms and all the hyperparameter tuning that I want to perform there. I can write code. Um, I want to do auto modeling. And so I'm going to actually pick quick prototypes. And what that does is basically going to step me through creating some visual models. So I'm not going to train right now. I'm going to actually go back. We're going to look at our existing. So We've got some modeling already um, already in here. And so I'm going to look at what we've already done here. So here we have a few different iterations or sessions of modeling. And you can see for each uh, session, we've got the different models that were run. I can see in this particular example, the random forest was the champion of the particular session or tournament. I can see information about the output. So again, this all comes down to the explainable AI or output of what we're producing in DSS. We want to be able to understand how it came to some result. So here I can clearly see all of the different information about this. If I go into this in a little bit more detail, I'm looking at the random forest in particular. I can see an overall measure of accuracy. I can look at the decision trees. So it just gives us an idea of how the actual end result was, was arrived at the importance of variables. So if I wanted to look at which variables were most important in terms of contributing to a prediction, I can see that here. Partial dependence, maybe looking at one specific variable and how it contributed to the prediction uh, overall. And a whole number of different types of views that tell us how this model was, was created and also how it performed. 
So if I go into performance, I can see a confusion matrix. This is particularly useful when I've got, for instance, this example of a binary categorical output. I can determine, you know, whether it predicted uh, accurately the, the actual failures or non-failures. Um, and so I can see the, all that information at a glance just by clicking through here. I can see the uh, ROC curve and basically look at for all of the different models, which one may be performed uh, the best and determine which one I might want to use. There's a lot of different ways that we can understand and interpret um, the model that was produced. Let me just go back to the model. So that was the output. Let's just kind of look at the input. So we looked at an auto modeling example and that just walked us through or created the modeling uh, on its own. But we can also go back and, and kind of tweak how that modeling was done. So here we can see the type of prediction that was performed. I can see what field was used as the target, and I can change all of this as well. So nothing is a black box in DataIQ DSS. It really allows the model developer to, to determine how the modeling is performed. Here I'm looking at the train test split. I can determine how that is performed, any other metrics. The feature generation, so if I want to look at how features were selected, here DSS just looked at each of the, the different fields uh, and determined was it appropriate or not based on its uh, correlation. Um, but I could also override and select a specific field. I could determine what the type of variable or type of field that I have. We can also leverage feature generation using different uh, linear and polynomial combinations. I can also reduce or have feature reduction using maybe principal component or another uh, a number of other methods. So everything is selectable. Here I'm actually looking at what algorithms were run against the data. So again, the auto modeling selected specific ones, but I could select any others. I could even bring in custom models. So down here at the bottom, we've got some custom models that are running against it, and then even specify how the hyperparameter uh, tuning is, is done as well. So that's how we create these models. We can have any number of different sessions um, to basically see the, the end result of those um, that gives us a real clear picture as to what actually happened uh, in the modeling steps. So once we've done the modeling, we want to leverage those models and put them into production. And this, again, is, is typically a, 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 a big challenge for a lot of organizations. So in this example, we've actually done it in a few different ways. Um, I've got a step here right within the flow, which is basically the scoring of some data. So I've taken the model that we created in our modeling tournament. I'm taking some new data, uh, asset information, uh, the components of our, our manufacturing process. I'm going to feed them into the model and score those. So basically, we can leverage the model directly right within the flow here, create an output, of basically score data that represents how the models uh, applied the prediction to that particular set of data. I can also leverage some automated means of creating uh, outputs or uh, execution of the models. So here I went into what are called scenarios, and scenarios are just automated scripts that basically allow you to run uh, and perform any number of different steps. So here you can base this on a time uh, base frequency or maybe some other trigger like a file existence or maybe just an API call. Um, once I've triggered it, we can execute the steps and then maybe have the output go to any number of different outputs. Let's just look at the steps here. I've got a number of different steps in this particular scenario that allow me to take the data, basically check the validity of the data, maybe run again our modeling against it, um, check the model performance. So build in checks as to the accuracy, making sure that the models aren't drifting, and then uh, retrain the models if necessary, all within the one scenario. So typically, we would take that um, and run those. Um, to do so, we might create what's called a bundle. And a bundle is basically just taking this particular project um, and taking it over into a production instance for, for automation and deployment. So it's very easy just to create a bundle here, and then I could take that, go over into my production environment. So here is my production node, and uh, I can see I've got my predictive maintenance model here, 
and I can basically look at how it might have executed over any number of different runs. Again, just looking to see if I need to maybe retrain it. I can also expose it as an API. So if I go into the API Deplorer, uh, I can see for all the different models that we have in our production environment, what's actually happening in terms of the uh, execution of all these different models. And you can see in this environment, we've broken it into the development, test, and production. So here I can actually work on the models as well. So if I want to go back, do some tweaking on the design, move it into test, test the modeling, and then actually move it into production only when it's um, based on, on what we want to see here. So I'm just going to look for our uh, predictive uh, maintenance one. So here we have it in production. If I click on this, we can see this was exposed as a particular URL endpoint. So that's our API endpoint. We can copy that and basically take it into some other application. And then basically anything can call it simply by the API passing in some inputs. So here are the features or the inputs that we're passing into the model and then execute it to get some output or prediction. So it just passes back the result of that and then we can uh, leverage that through uh, the APIs. So a number of different ways that we can productionalize uh, our models and get them um, basically uh, providing business insights into our organization. So just to summarize, we looked at um, our building of the, of the um, pro projects by pulling in the data from our different data sources, applying all the different transformations in the form of visual recipes and code recipes, um, joining the data together, performing an iterative cycle of modeling to basically get to some point of um, uh, accuracy or performance of those models, and then taking the model and deploying it and so that we can leverage the result of what we've produced um, uh, within that, that project. So that basically completes the cycle of uh, creating our, our analytical projects um, and how Data IQ DSS basically operates models, uh, model workflows to get them basically into production faster. So with that, I will stop and we'll open it up for questions.